In January 1987, Enix published a sequel to their Chunsoft developed smash hit that had taken Japan by storm only eight months prior in May of 1986. While largely forgotten today, this title greatly expanded the conventions and consciousness of the genre that its precursor established. It offered a larger world, more freedom, sailing, multiple party members, and a tremendous challenge. And that music. Sheesh. Welcome to Dragon Quest II. Leaps and Bounds. I don't know about you, but I never hear much of anything about this game. Dragon Quest 1 you still see a good bit of discussion on, because it did it first. And Dragon Quest 3 and 4 I've heard from multiple sources are excellent games, including some of my favorite channels like Happy Console Gamer. Dragon Quest 5 and Dragon Quest 8 seem to be the ones that people recommend jumping into first if you're new to the series. And outside of maybe Dragon Quest 6, Dragon Quest 2 has just kind of fallen off the radar. But it's not like that everywhere. I stumbled across a live performance of the OST for Dragon Quest 2 after completing the game, and while the comments were almost exclusively in Japanese, after translating them I was kind of moved by what so many of them had to say. For many, this game brought forth warm memories of youth and adventure, and for a surprising amount, hearing some of the songs moved them to tears. Given how much it has to offer, I'm surprised by the fact that you almost never hear about this game. For January 1987, I'm not sure you can do much better than this when it comes to turn-based RPGs. Like the first title in the series, Dragon Quest II was rebranded as Dragon Warrior II in the West, and it released nearly four years after the original Japanese version. It's a massive gap that I think might potentially explain, to me at least, why this title is so often dismissed, and also why so few people seem to have memories of it here. It also brings back the entire core team featured in Dragon Quest 1 that helped to make that game the cultural titan that it was with Koichi Nakamura directing, Yuji Horii designing, Akira Toriyama of Dragon Ball fame handling the enemy and character designs, and Koichi Sugiyama composing the music. It's very impressive to me right out the gate just how much Dragon Quest II builds upon the first game and how much more it has to offer. It adds so much to the formula and most of what it added stuck and became convention in later entries in the series. Now, for some personal context, Dragon Quest 1 is the only other Dragon Quest game that I have completed from beginning to end in the series. So while I've briefly dabbled in Dragon Quest 6, Dragon Quest 7, and Dragon Quest 8, the only game I really have to stack up against Dragon Quest 2 is the first game. And from my perspective, I have to say, I really enjoyed Dragon Warrior 2. So allow me to take you on a journey of what this game has to offer, what I think it does better than the first game, how I think it stacks up as a 1987 RPG title, how I think it's best experienced today and how I managed to have a lot of fun with it personally, and why I ultimately think that this game is a bit underappreciated.
So to get the basics out of the way, Dragon Quest II is very similar to its predecessor, Dragon Quest I, but it improves upon it in just about every way imaginable. Like the first title, it's a game in which you traverse a large overworld navigating between different points of interest, such as towns, castles, and dungeons. You do this in order to gain information, to fight enemies, to level up, or to acquire items that are needed to open up new modes of transportation or to gain access to otherwise inaccessible areas of the world. The combat is turn-based, where you select options from a menu to best suit a variety of encounters. And the battles occur at random through interruptions while traversing the overworld, the ocean, and the dungeons. So on paper so far, it looks to be pretty much the same game as Dragon Quest 1. But from the very beginning, it's clear that Dragon Quest 2 is a different animal. Enix. Dragon Quest 2 in the West makes this known immediately as you're treated to quite a robust intro sequence showing you rather than telling you what's happening in the game. The game takes place 100 years after the events of Dragon Quest 1 and shows minions of a new antagonist, Hargon, storming a new location not seen in the first game known as Moonbrook Castle. One guard manages to escape from the wreckage and makes an impressive trek to Maidenhall Castle to inform the King of Maidenhall what just went down. And the game begins with you controlling the Prince of Maidenhall on a quest to defeat Hargon. But there are a lot of things you must do in order to make that happen, including searching out five crests hidden throughout the world. The Star Crest, the Moon Crest, the Sun Crest, the Water Crest, and the Life Crest. You're also tasked with recruiting help, because unlike the first game, you have a party of up to three members, featuring the Princess of Moonbrook and the Prince of Canock, royalty from two neighboring kingdoms. The story is easy to digest, and I think that I like it more than Dragon Quest One's story. I love the idea of searching out the crests. It's simple, but it's effective. And I love that it's not a solo trek this time around. Not that there's anything wrong with that. The new party members add a lot to the turn-based battling and give you a lot more to think about over the course of item and MP management when navigating through difficult stretches of the land, the sea, different caves, and different dungeons. The main unit character, the Prince of Maidenhall, is melee only. And this is also the most tanky of the group since he can wear the largest variety of armor and usually has a head start to leveling. The Prince of Kanak is generally weaker than the Prince of Maidenhall for most of the journey. He does okay damage through melee attacks, but the big advantage to having him as a party member is his access to magic attacks and healing and curing of poison. The Princess of Moonbrook is the last to join the party and is, generally speaking, the biggest liability. But she gains access to some powerful magic sooner than the Prince of Canock does and gets attacks that can damage multiple enemies pretty early on, making her a huge asset to the team. These characters also get different names based on what you named your character. In my game, it was Illith, pretty sick, and Artho. But no longer is Dragon Quest just a press A to win game, and no longer are you fighting against only a single enemy at a time. You can be pitted against up to eight enemies at once in Dragon Quest 2, and I found myself running away a lot more often in this game than I did the first because it was fun to push the boundaries and explore past where I felt was safe for me. There are also smaller improvements that just make the moment to moment better in Dragon Quest 2. There is no longer a stairs option that you have to activate from the menu in order to go up or down stairs. You now do obvious things like that automatically. And the battle theme in this game is a vast improvement. It's not nearly as grating as it is in Dragon Quest 1. The caves in darker areas also no longer require a torch to light up. When you go into an area that would have previously been dark in Dragon Quest, you can just see where you need to go. It's kind of like in Monster Hunter when they removed hot and cold drinks. It's just one less thing to worry about. Does it sacrifice a small portion of immersion? Yes, but you don't really miss them once they're removed. I don't miss it.
basically. There are also effects that display roofs over certain areas or roofs over certain areas that become transparent when you walk into them, which is a nice effect. Additionally, while many items and armors make their return unaltered from the first title, there are several new ones and some weapons and armors that can be used from the menu as reusable items in battle, such as the Shield of Strength and the Staff of Thunder. The overworld here offers a lot more variety than the first game, and it even includes a smaller, shrunk-down version of Alephgard, complete with the original overworld theme. You can also find the Dragon Lord's son, who is currently residing in Charlock Castle from the first game. He's also somewhat supportive of your endeavors here, because he doesn't like Hargon either. From his perspective, all that is his land, so... There are also a lot of portals known as Traveler's Gates that allow you to warp all over the world if you know where they are, and this can speed up your traversal of Dragon Quest II. There are more enemies, more bosses, more dungeons, more landmass, more characters, and you gain access to a ship allowing you to navigate the seas. There's more challenge, there are more points of interest, there's more music, and there's more humor. And yeah, more doesn't always mean better. And I think a lot of games suffer from that mentality. But in this case, it's not bad. I realize I haven't detailed my personal experience with this game yet, so this statement is a little premature, but I really liked Dragon Quest too. I think it's a good more. I think more works here. It's not a filler more or a Mandy Moore. Dragon Quest II is just a lot of game for 1987. There's a lot to do, there are different ways to go about beating it, and there are different angles that you can approach this game from. I found it more engaging than the first game, at least the original versions of the first game. These games have a lot of different versions. I am strictly talking about the NES and Famicom versions here, and pretty specifically the NES or Dragon Warrior versions of these games. But this game makes big strides for the genre, and it doesn't do a whole lot wrong. What it does do wrong, though, is enough to turn some people off completely. And I do believe that for some, it's too much. I think if you're one of those people, that's valid and I don't blame you, but I think a big part of whether or not you're having fun with this game can come from how you're approaching it, but I'll touch on that more later. So, I experienced this game differently than most, I would assume. If you're new to this series, I'm playing these games in the context of their original systems chronologically. I haven't played the majority of these games before, and I like to approach them as spoiler-free as possible. I like to get that quote-unquote real experience, and I like to get it in the context of when these games originally came out. But I bent my own rules a little bit for this one, from the start. I felt okay researching the game and how I wanted to approach it. Given the popularity of guides and magazines with hints from the time, especially used in this type of game, I never felt like I was cheating myself by preparing before I jumped in. I would bring up a map of the world while I was at work and sort of plan my approach. I had the manual as well and a list of needed items and good places to farm and grind and make money and I'd set goals for myself to accomplish when I had the time to play. Sometimes I would reach my goals for like a given day and then other times I did have some difficulties. Often I would find myself straying from my self-set objectives to explore some area that looked appealing to me, not too unlike a contemporary open world game. I also developed my own sort of rhythm and took note of where I liked to save from the most, and I get that this is all very nebulous and I will share how it actually felt to tackle the different phases of this journey, but this was the big picture for my approach. And in terms of fun, I'm really glad that I did it this way. The NPC characters are more helpful in this game than they are in the first game, as far as telling you where to find key items and where you need to go, but I found myself having fun planning what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go outside of the game. Then I would embark on those mini adventures within the context of the game as a whole. It was really charming, and if you have found that you 
have taste that's similar to mine, I would really recommend playing it this way. The game offers more than enough challenge on its own without having to piece together where to find niche items. The way that I view this game, there are three separate phases to the journey. The classic phase, the crest hunting phase, and the push to and through roan phase. The classic phase has you working through a gameplay loop very similar to that of Dragon Quest 1. You have your starting area with shops and towns, weaker enemies around the castle, some shops and vendors selling items to aid you, gear that you can't afford, and ends where you can sleep to heal members of your party and restore magic points. You'll make your way through the lands of Maidenhall and Canuck and through areas like the Spring of Bravery and the Lake Cave before using the Canuck monolith to make your way under the water to the land of Moonbrook, stopping at places like Hamelin and the Mirror Swamp and the Eastern Tower and the ruins of Moonbrook Castle. The game then sort of guides you across another straight through the Moonbrook monolith and across the desert up to the Dragonhorn Towers, where you and your party have to make it across in order to make it to Leonport, where you encounter the first true boss of the game and where you gain access to the ship, which opens up the next and largest phase of this game. And from this point on, whenever you use the return spell, you will visit the last town that you saved at, and the ship will appear outside of the shore of the save spot. The game has a few towns that can act as decent bases of operation for approaching the world, but my favorite for most of the game was Maidenhall Castle. So the next phase is the crest hunting phase. The original land of Alethgard becomes accessible from this point, and the game sort of nudges you in that direction after making it out of Leonport. The old overworld theme plays here, and I imagine for players who were especially fond of the first game, this would have been a really nice treat. And the game is extremely open once the sea opens up. You can go almost anywhere so long as you don't get KO'd by powerful enemies at sea. And it's kind of overwhelming the amount of different directions to go. If you're the type of gamer who, no matter what, wants to do it on your own, it's definitely still possible to beat, but without a solid game plan, it can take a bit longer to find what you actually need from each of these places. The manual that comes with the game contains a ton of information though, detailing every spell and item and armor found in the game. And it also gives pretty robust hints, so at the very least, reading the manual is recommended. And the PDF is just online for Dragon Warrior 2 in English. If you play this game, Highly recommend downloading that to your desktop. Or better yet, printing out a copy. I love this portion of the game though. Maidenhall Castle was my home base for most of it, but I did stay a few other places over the course of my adventure. Another important place you want to stop every time a party member is defeated though is an area known as the World Tree which is one of the southernmost areas of the world. There you can get a leaf of the world tree, which is a consumable item that allows you to revive a party member that can only be found there. Different portions of the sea have varying levels of difficulty with the enemy encounters, but luckily running away has a pretty high success rate in this game. And I think that's partially to encourage you to push further in this game than you might've felt comfortable pushing in Dragon Quest 1 without feeling too punished through death. You will need to visit just about every location shown on the map in order to beat the game. So upon seeing an icon on the map, it's good to take note of it and anything you see there that you can't currently access so that you can return later when you can. Keys and doors that require certain keys are typically the barriers that will prompt you to return to these places. And it's almost a little bit like a Metroidvania in that respect. I do really enjoy the layout of the world though. I like the idea of sailing the seas and seeking out the crests that could be anywhere. I like imagining the world tree and what it might look like and the importance of my party visiting and risking our lives just to get there. The quest feels big and it feels like a classic as you're playing it. Once you pick a home base for exploring the world, the following are the places that you pretty much must visit in order to beat the game. The Lighthouse. 
Osterfair Castle, the town of Welgarth, the town of Toon, the town of Zahar, the Moon Tower, the Fire Monolith, the Rubus Monolith, the Sea Cave, the town of Baran, the Cave to Rome, Crone itself, and Hargon's castle. The Star Crest is found in the Lighthouse Dungeon. The Moon Crest is found in Osterfair Castle. The Sun Crest is found at the Fire Shrine. The Water Crest is found hidden back in the town of Hamlin, and the Life Crest is found in the cave to run. There's a lot to do, and Alephgard is actually optional. I don't believe there's anything there that you actually have to get. It's just kind of there as a bonus. Once you locate all of the crests and then use them to get the charm of Rubus from the Rubus monolith, the final phase of the game begins, which is the quest to and through Roan. You'll have to head to the Baron Monolith and hold an item called the Eye of Malroth high above your head to gain access to the Cave to Rhone, which is full of extremely difficult enemies and pitfalls. It even has what is essentially a giant pit of zombies known as Horks that you can fall into. If you can make it to Rhone though, and you can make it just a little bit further to the Rhone Monolith, you're given the best spot for grinding in the entire game, and you're free to stick it out here until the very end. If you do need to leave, you can warp away to the world and then use the spell of return to come right back. It is the most difficult portion of the game because the suite of monsters have amazing movesets, and some of them can auto-defeat you or members of your party, or in those dang baboons case, KO your entire party in one hit. It's not that big of an issue though, to be honest, since the only penalty for complete failure is the loss of gold. So you can keep going until you feel comfortable making a dash to Hargon's castle. There's also a way in which you can use Hargon's own illusionary power against him through a certain glitch in his castle, which I found to be really cool and almost like a canon glitch within the game. When you finally make it to Hargon's castle, it's under an illusion that makes it look like Maidenhall Castle. And once you break that illusion, you have to make your way up to the final boss. And you're treated to several boss tier enemies as you make your way to the top of the castle. The Atlas. The Bazuzu. And the Zarlocks. All three of which are strong enough to end a run to Hargon. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say treated, but for me it was a treat because I loved their designs and I loved the difficulty. But the good thing is that if you do die, you can just go right back. And once you beat them, you shouldn't have to fight them again unless you reload your save. And you can just make your way to the top uninterrupted. Hargon himself though is no joke. He loves targeting the weakest link, he loves healing himself with heal all, and he loves just instantly KOing the Princess of Moonbrook. But once you defeat Hargon, you're treated to the true final boss, which is even harder. And that's Malroth. It is extremely cool and somewhat cinematic, quote unquote cinematic, for an 8-bit game cinematic, when Malroth reveals himself. And if you manage to defeat Malroth, you're free to walk the earth of Dragon Quest II monster free and speak to NPCs and witness how people feel liberated from evil before triggering the credits back at Maidenhall Castle. Now again, for 1987, January 1987, 
That is a hell of a sequence of events to go through. It is amazing what they pulled off for a console cartridge-based game. So typically, I like to detail every item, every enemy, every boss, every little thing that they can do, all with names and images in great detail. I do think that it's valuable to do so for certain games, and I will probably continue to do so when I feel like it makes sense. But for this game and this instance, I think it makes more sense just to point out some highlights of my game, of my time playing the game, to keep the runtime down at least a little bit to not deter too many people who may just be curious about Dragon Quest II. And I think in the context of a story, it makes sense to tell my many stories that I experienced within it. So the first time that I put the cartridge in and turned it on, I wanted to experience just the Japanese version. I knew I wouldn't be able to do this for the whole game, but I wanted to do it at least for a little bit. And uh, I had a difficult time making my way around the menu. I also went in blindly just to get that experience, just a piece of what it tasted like with Dragon Warrior 2, the Western version. And seeing that opening sequence hit me in a big way. I watched it like three times. I was really impressed and um, it was great. You know, I the stairs right off the bat, getting to use the stairs, not having to select the stairs option from the menu. And I did find it to be quite difficult. I was struggling a little bit more. This game also removes the loop of learning the heal spell yourself since the main unit the Prince of Maidenhall doesn't have access to magic at all. So you do have to spend money to stay at the inn. I made my way to a few towns and to the castle of Canock, and that's about when I restarted my journey and made a new save file to start fresh after I had a solid plan. And the first thing I did once I had a solid plan was lottery ticket abuse. So. You could grind enemies right from the beginning, but um, I like exploits in games. I have fun with exploits. I like taking pieces of knowledge I have about a game and using them to my advantage. Like in games where you can get strong weapons early, I love seeking them out. And in this instance, you can seek them out without fighting anything at all by buying herbs. I found this out by mistake my first time playing this game because um, the first herb I bought, I was given a lottery ticket and I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, there was nowhere to play the lottery in the castle of Maidenhall. And so I looked it up and it turns out you can sell lottery tickets for around a little over 50 gold and they're given to you at quite a high rate like one in eight or something ridiculous like that so if you continually buy antidote herbs i bought regular herbs at first because i didn't know it worked with both to be honest but if you continually buy those you can sell them all back you can sell back the lottery tickets and you can make enough money to buy the strongest items that you're able to equip at the time and from that it feels similar to getting the white sword first in Zelda 1. It makes tackling the dungeons a lot easier. So that was cool. I found it pretty funny how the Prince of Canock plays hard to get a little bit at the beginning when you're trying to get him to join your party. You turn up to the castle. His sister is like, do you know this man? Do you know this man? If you don't, then get out. But then you can say, yeah, I do. And then she'll say, okay, well, in that case, he's at the Spring of Bravery. In which case you go to the Spring of Bravery He's not there. So then it's like, huh, he went to back to Canuck. So then you go back to Canuck, not there. And I think he's in the town of Left Wayne, but it's just funny, like you're bouncing around and then finally you meet him and it's like, let's go. The Princess of Moonbrook is also a dog. There's a dog that if you talk to, uh, I believe in the town of Hamlin, just starts following you. And there's also a really cool hint that there's something to be found in an area where there are four bridges or four separate water things visible. That's where you find the Mirror of Ra, which is one of many items that have kind of like one real use in this game that is kind of just to progress the story. In this case, you shine it on the Princess of Moonbrook and then she becomes her true self. You could have found this out by going and investigating Moonbrook Castle, or you could have just kind of put two and two together. But once she's in the party, it's just 
nice visually to see them walking behind you. You know, it's it's nice. I like it. I love an 8-bit games and 2D games in general where you have people that follow you and just copy your movements. It's comfy, okay? It's comfy. I also think the towers are all cool. The Eastern Towers, the Dragon Horns, they look like a leaning tower of Pisa, except not leaning. And they usually have a mechanic where if you go off the edge, you fall to the bottom. Or in some cases, if you go through the middle, you fall to the bottom. But they're fun to make their way up. And I like that the backgrounds are blue. It's a little more pleasant to look out than some of the dungeons in Dragon Quest 1 where the backgrounds were just black. Also, this goes back to how you approach this game. But I have heard that this game has an insane amount of grinding required. And I would say, I think that overall, if you know what you're doing, this game has significantly, significantly less grinding than the NES version of Dragon Quest 1. You get stronger just by going to the places that you need to go, fighting what you need to fight, and getting stronger gear. And I didn't really have to grind too much. I did a little bit. I did. But I didn't have to grind too much until, like, I, I didn't hit a point where I absolutely had to grind until I was in Roan. But going back to the towers, leaping off the Dragon Horn Tower with the Cloak of Wind to get to the other side. That's a nice touch. I like the visual of that. And then after you beat the first boss, after you make it through the Dragonhorn Tower and Leonport, um, sailing is a thrill. Seeing all this water and all this ocean around you in the first game and some islands and knowing that you couldn't get to them, it's just very liberating. And it, it feels great. They all pile in and you're on your way. Also, one of the first places to visit once you get it, um, you hear a lot of rumors from NPCs talking about this shipwreck where there's this sunken treasure. Well, sure enough, towards the top of the map, there is a shipwreck site. And if you search there, you find the echoing flute. And the echoing flute, you play it and it alerts you to whether or not there is a crest nearby. And this is an excellent tool for if you don't even feel like talking to anyone, just going to all the different places that are interesting, playing the echoing flute and listening for something back. And I remember for me, the first time I played it and I heard it play back, the medley is beautiful. I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but I played it over and over just because I liked the sound of it. I liked hearing it. And this whole process of searching out the crests felt very immersive for me. I could just imagine it. Like I, I could imagine myself and my characters in the world. It sparked my imagination in a way that I think some games like this have to do in order for them to make an impression. I think games that trigger your imagination oftentimes grip you more than games that are telling you everything visually and graphically that they want to show you in a game. In a 2D game, the world can be as big as your mind lets it, but in some 3D games, it's hard to kind of expand the world and make it feel bigger than what they're physically showing you. It can be done though. I have done it in some games. Anyway, that was a useless aside. Apologies. Now, Erdrich's sword is outclassed in this game pretty soon after you get it if you know what you want. And I still got it because, you know, it's Erdrich's sword. When am I gonna not use it? So I, I explored Alephgard and the primary reason I did it was to talk to people to see what was happening and really so I could go down and get Erdrich's sword so I could use it for a little while. <laughs> the repel spell in this game, I used a lot, very frequently, and it was really useful to have a higher powered weapon equipped to the main unit, the Prince of Maidenhall, because it was his attack stat that determines whether or not you're going to encounter a party of monsters. I, I feel like it's a lot easier in this game to avoid fights when you don't want them. And I think that's also the smartest way to go about it. I think it could get Pretty annoying if you engaged in every single fight that you came across. Now, one thing I noticed that was not my favorite was when a character dies, it's nice that you don't just auto lose and it's nice that the character's not gone for good so you have to reset your game, but 
they no longer gain XP until you can find a place to revive them, like a healer, which is a, a place that breaks curses and heals ailments and revives party members. I think it's cool that the revival spell sounds like kind of an inverse of the game over sound, but the Princess of Moonbrook came to my party last and I had done a little bit of grinding before I got to her. And so I think it might've made more sense in retrospect to book it to her, get her in the party and then grind because she was constantly like a few levels below where I feel she was for most other people I saw online playing this game. So it was, she would die more frequently and she just kept falling further and further behind. And it wasn't until the end when she got her most powerful magic explode it and um, heal all that she wasn't dying quite as frequently. And I would usually prioritize protecting her just to make sure that she still got the experience. Now, the lottery ticket trick works for a while, but the best way to get money in this game is by fighting this insane evil clown enemy that is locked up under Maidenhall Castle. And I did this probably 15 times going down there, getting an item from him called the Staff of Thunder, selling the Staff of Thunder, saving my game, turning it off, turning it on, fighting him again. Now you cap out in the amount of gold that you're able to carry pretty quickly, but I would do this whenever I needed cash, basically. Whenever I was broke, I'd head back and I'd do it again. The Staff of Thunder is also excellent, by the way. Using it as an item, being able to hit multiple enemies, anything that allows you to hit multiples, is just goaded in this game. I did take advantage of a few glitches, if you can call them that. They're not really glitches. I think a better way to put it would be exploits. One of them is you're only supposed to be able to get one water flying cloth, but a lot of whether items are available or not in this game is determined in the game by whether or not it's actually in your inventory. So once you get two valuable items known as the Dew's Yarn and the Magic Loom, you can have this one craftsman make them. And then while he's making it, it takes a save and a restart for him to give it to you. You go and you get those things again. And as soon as the transaction's made and he gives it to you, you give him the Dew's Yarn and the Magic Loom again, and you get another one basically. And it's just a really useful armor for both the Prince of Kanak and the Princess of Moonbrook to wear. Not everyone can wear every armor set. And so the only person who can wear the really strong armors typically is the Prince of Hall or you. So that was a useful exploit. I thought it was really cool in tune using the Watergate key to drain it and um, how it created a shortcut in the map because it was really hard to get to first, which I thought was cool. It showed you a maze and there was like, that is kind of like that environmental, visual, purely visual puzzle solving that I like to see in a game. And another thing that's ridiculous that I would not have found, I don't think, if I didn't look it up, was the location of the Jailer's Key. So the Jailer's Key, there are NPCs that talk about this guy that's somewhere and he's got the jailer's key and you know, there is, it's hinted to strongly, but he's hidden in the dark and like a corner, just a random corner that you have to talk to. But what's <laughs> like you, you talk and he's like, Oh no, I've been found. And then you get the jailer's key. And it's like one of the most important keys in the game, unless you have the unlock spell. But that means that every important, place where you'd need it, you'd need to use the unlock spell. So that's not really practical. So what is interesting though, all of the different NPC types in this game respond with the same text per NPC type when you talk to them after you beat the game. And I made a point to go back and talk to this legendary thief that had the jailer's key just to see what kind of NPC he was. And I did. Now, when you're grinding in round, you become, you know, very, very aware of the move sets and everything that these monsters can do to hurt you. Some of them can take away your magic points. Some of them can instantly defeat members of your party. But one important thing to note is that the last monster you defeat in a group of monsters, that's the monster that can drop items. Sometimes when you defeat monsters, you pick up treasure chests in this game. 
or gold or like items. It's it's cool. I like it. But two items, the cursed armor and the sword of destruction or the cursed sword, they're only found off of specific enemies that you have to fight and run. And I didn't actually have to grind for any of them outside of the actual grinding that I was currently doing. I was very lucky. And the other exploit that I took advantage of in this game was one where when you go to the, when you go to Hargon's castle and it's currently under that illusion, anything that you buy there or equip is removed because it's an illusion. So it can have you spending a whole lot of money and thinking that you're doing things that you're actually not. It's a trick basically but you can use that trick against the game. And uh, and that you can equip the cursed armor or the gremlin's armor too, I believe it's called, or the sword of destruction. And when you leave, you have the bonuses from that still applied to your character from when you were in there, but they're not actually equipped. It's just stacked upon whatever you currently had equipped. So the Prince of Canock can get a huge defensive buff, which is great because he's kind of weak, honestly. And the Prince of Maidenhall can use the Falcon Sword, which you can use to do two hits, and it can stack the damage on top of that of the Sword of Destruction. So it makes grinding in particular very effective. However, once you level up, the game resets all of those bonuses and just reapplies what you currently have equipped. So that is the downside, but it's still a fun thing to take advantage of in order to grind more effectively temporarily. Now, the final push through Hargon's Castle, I think I had to make five attempts before I finally got it. And I was lucky enough to, when I was replaying the end portion of this game on the CRT for some footage, to get it again on the very first try, which was crazy. But I love it. I love this final buildup. You do have to cast the spell that makes it so you don't take damage from the squares that cause damage on the ground quite a lot. But it's satisfying and it's cool that you're just in the world and you're free to walk around and talk to everyone and kind of chill as long as you want until you're ready for that game to end it's a big long adventure and you're free to just relax for a minute you know walk around uninterrupted as if you had the repel spell on and no enemy could challenge you and then it's cool you can talk to your companions um, before you take the throne because they the game does force you to take the throne it is you know it'd be cool if you could walk away it is what it is but you're treated to one of the better ending songs i've heard it's not the best that's probably metroid but one of the better ending songs i've heard there's actually like a version with lyrics an actual recorded song that i'll probably link it's excellent <laughs> And a lot of the music in this game is excellent, and it's definitely a big standout for me. So, final thoughts on Dragon Quest II. Dragon Warrior 2 in the West. My final thoughts for the first game were, it's a good game, but there were just all these hangups that frustrated me and that I just didn't find very fun about the first game. And I think this game, while it's very similar for that first classic phase, is different enough and is more fun kind of overall in almost every single facet of its gameplay. There's something to be said for the purity of Dragon Quest 1, where it really is an adventure game where you're kind of given a radius that's safe, and as you get stronger, you push the boundaries of that radius, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger as you progress. That's less so true in Dragon Quest 2. While Dragon Quest 2 is very open, it definitely encourages you to kind of push through different boundaries, like maybe between two safer zones, you have to break through from one bubble to land in the other bubble safely. That's not a good or a bad thing, it's just a neutral thing. It's just a difference. And I do think that like 
Overall, the simplicity and spirit of Dragon Warrior 1, I think if that is perfected, I might prefer that. But looking at these two games, for me, it's not close. Dragon Warrior 2 blows Dragon Warrior 1 out of the water. It's fun. <laughs> it sounds weird to say that because, you know, I don't know. A lot of people I really respect the opinion of have videos on this game that say, you know what, it's just not that good. And maybe it's just part of the way I chose to experience it, but I had fun. Now, is it amazing? Kind of, for what it pulls off. It's kind of amazing what they managed to cram onto this and how much of it worked. But like, it's clear playing it that there's still room for improvement. Like maybe it wouldn't have been so clear at the time for people who played it then, but um, it's like a game that piques my curiosity as to where it's gonna go next. And um, you know, it's a little bit of a wait to get to Dragon Warrior 3 or Dragon Quest 3 and Final Fantasy is going to cut in here before that happens. So I'm interested to see which one is, you know, resonating with me stronger. But yeah, it's a hard game. And I think to enjoy it, you just have to know how you like to enjoy this kind of game. That's pretty much how Dragon Quest 2 is sitting for me right now. It's subject to change as I play more games like this. But overall... It's good to me and thanks for watching. Peace.